we've heard of those microchips to riches stories of retailers who have made millions of whiz kids who have risen high in far off britain and the us of men of steel and women in space the non-resident indian has been scripting unique success stories throughout the globe this is the story of some of them from the region of gulf those who have been the true ambassadors whose vision and dedication has kept the indian flag flying across the world they come from different strata of society and from different professions the common denominator is their success and the mark they have left in the country of their adoption countries of the gulf occupy a vitally important place in india's extended neighborhood because of their geographical proximity cultural linkages and economic complementarities many indians both unskilled and semi-skilled workers as well as professionals live and work in these countries contributing significantly to economic development of these countries the oil boom of the 1970s had sparked off a large scale movement of both blue and white collar workers presently there are about 4.5 million indians in the gulf country as one lands in kuwait city it is impossible to miss the jashanmal skyscraper skyscraper which is today a landmark in kuwait houses one of the biggest indian retail and wholesale outlets in the gulf region the chief executive officer of jashanmal national company tony jashanmal is the third generation of a pioneering indian family who took the mantle of kuwait's expansion and development tony's grandfather rao saheb jashanmal was invited by the british to kuwait to run a department store in 1932 a time when provisions were sparse the oil had been found and a lot of britishers and americans would be coming to kuwait and they would require a lot of products to settle and therefore we were requested to open a similar department store as we had in Iraq to do the same in Kuwait to cater for these people where under one roof you could find a very big variety of items where english was spoken where prices were fixed and so on and so forth the spiraling growth of kuwait has been a result of imaginative vigorous and combined effort of not just kuwaitis but also pioneering families like the jashanmals they identified the call for an import driven economy and explored its possibilities to the optimum tony credits the success to healthy relations of mutual confidence and respect they are the hosts you are in their country they have let you stay in those countries all these years do your businesses do whatever you want with your money uh never socially uh put you down people should be thankful we decided to go there and from that angle they've been very very hospitable jashan mouls came to the middle east to make their living they did not come to share the prosperity because that prosperity was yet not there at that time kuwait was an obscure settlement under the thumb of imperial britain that one couldn't even find on the map but over the 75 years they've been here they've made themselves an integral part of their adopted home the older people there oh you tell the younger people is it Oh Jashan Mall is as before there was only one shop we had no choice we had to go to Jashan Mall but I, I think and which we've always done and which we always would continue to do is put this across to all our people that you have to be part of the community you're part of the social life and you have to be active 
as my grandfather said, you have to be involved, but not by giving money only. No, with time and effort. Another Indian who is willingly investing her time and effort in this country is Dr. Mariam Chishti. As an MBBS from Lady Hardinge Medical College, Delhi, she had a motley set of job opportunities to explore when she chose to move bag and baggage to Kuwait. Today, she is the senior most gynecologist in Kuwait. She is respected here not only as a surgeon and a medical consultant, but also as a researcher and administrator. I was taking a lot of patients even when, when I was not on call. So this was the triggering point. Whenever they needed me, I was there. Not like other consultants that they will not come for normal cases and things like that. I was ready to take care of them even at night, middle of the night. Through her unflinching and committed work in Kuwait's Jahra Hospital, she has raised the reputation of Indian medical professionals in the eyes of Kuwaiti citizens, medical experts, as well as the government. Indians like Dr. Chishti and Jashanmal are just a small cross-section of the largest and most vibrant expatriate nationals in Kuwait who are helping in various sectors of the economy. Countries in the Gulf need several foreign people. And as long as we as foreigners keep to their rules and regulations, do not abuse their customs. We've lived through difficult political times, but have not had any seep over problems as Indian or other nationals in the Gulf countries yet. Fifty-year-old Vinay Divan can trace his success back to a sudden decision. He had an extremely easy-going job in India when he decided to chuck it all up and move to Bahrain. This mining engineer was working with ICI, then known as Indian Explosives, when he heard of talks of building a 27-kilometer causeway through the sea between Bahrain and Saudi Arabia. Even as the locals were skeptical of venturing into a business territory that was yet uncharted, Divan took the plunge, typifying the classic entrepreneurial trait. He quit his job to form a pioneering quarrying firm, Bramco, as a managing partner with a minority stake. I knew what the deposits of limestone in Bahrain are. Geology is in my blood. So I could see geologically they had a very good deposit of limestone and there was potential. So I put only $1,500 as my capital and the others put small money and I started the company with very small money doing everything myself, you see. And uh, I was only 10%. And over the years I bought over the shares from my partners every year, every, every what, three years, four years. And in 1993 I became 100% owner of my own company. Over the 26 years, Divan's company has reached the top rung in the stone industry. It has seen itself grow from a Bahrain-based limestone quarry operator to a diversified group with operations extending beyond the Gulf to Germany, the UK, USA and India. Today, this multinational group has a turnover close to $100 million with a portfolio of mining, metallurgy and manufacturing. And Divan credits all his success to a simple business trait, honesty. I really never tried to take a lead or overtake an Arab local. I always said, you take the job, I will help you do it. You be the main contractor, I'll be a subcontractor. Big Bahrainis and important people, they like me because I don't cross their, I don't tread on their shoes, you see. I try to help them achieve a target. My ultimate game is to achieve something. Not that I want to have a flag that this is mine and I did it.
Like Divan, Suresh Virmani had a high-profile career in Voltas India when he decided that his energy could not be bottled up in a routine job. He had to own a company and be the master of his destiny. In 1977, when he started Bahwan Engineering Company, business atmosphere in Oman was low-keyed, but passion possessed this dogged optimist from India. He worked hard to establish himself in a market dominated by large Western contractors with decades of experience. How do you put the same emotion, the, the same passion, the same feeling that every person working at site feels it is his project. They work as a team to put that dream also and put life and soul into the mortar and the brick which everybody can buy. The steel, uh, you know, you put life and then you become a contractor. You really walk through the project as if if it's a hotel, you should imagine you're living, going to live in it. If it's a hospital, you should imagine you're going to be treated there. And if it's industry, you should know that how the product is going to flow and then you put life into it. From a small beginning with just 14 employees, Virmani steered the company to the present glory with operations in Oman and UAE, employing over 6,200 people. Today, BEC is acknowledged as a leader in trading, contracting and facilities management. Virmani has weathered several cycles of intense recession and built a resilient organization capable of sustaining itself. 1977, there was one Indian school with less than 70 to 80 children. Coming from Bombay with my daughter going to JB Petit, you look forward to good schools. I knew that there is a schooling problem. So, school was in just two and a half rooms, shanty rooms, I will call them. Uh, there was a makeshift lady principal with three teachers. That was the end of it. That principal was clerk also, admission officer also, everything. Then you think, did you make the right decision? Are you sacrificing your children's life because of your aspirations or, or man my story or, 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 or whatever it was? But then came, this is an opportunity. This school has to take a next direction. It is just the beginning. These bold plungers who came to the country before the oil boom have been through testing personal times. But even as the businesses were booming, there were some equally visionary Indians who foresaw that the diaspora of the Middle East would require a strong foundation of stability and continuity. And education was a provision that could not be neglected at any cost. <laughs> Mr. M. J. Siddiqui is principal of India International School in Riyadh and has been an integral part of the larger effort of building the community's capabilities and strengthening its social infrastructure. Family is stable here because of the school. If you don't have a school, the will, family will not stay here. Mm -hmm. And automatically, whatever the Indian are here because of family. Mm -hmm. The school is playing a very important role for the development of the full family establishment. Dr. V. Masilamani is another educationist from this country who has been chasing opportunities beyond every horizon. A physics professor in Riyadh's King Saud University, he is in the forefront of education and medical research. This respected Indian laser scientist has achieved a major breakthrough in the detection of cancer based on laser and light-induced fluorescence. The discovery is deemed significant since the technique could be applied in the kingdom where the incidence of oral and other types of cancer has been reported on a growing scale. Latest development which we did the last two years, partly in India and partly in Saudi Arabia in this King's Saudi University is detect cancer in 
first 5 ml u of urine, just we need 5 ml of urine, first urine and then we could say that this person has no cancer at all or here is a poor lady who has got in the early stage of cancer, here is a person who is in advanced stage of cancer. All the three we were able to delineate. The doctor's achievements here are a consequence of the classic model where two nations with varying resources join hands for a partnership of progress and development for their people. Indians are technically very, very qualified and they have earned a very good reputation that they are very sincere, trustworthy. These are the two things that over years Indians have built in whole of Middle East. So, and they have the technical excellence also. Because of this one, uh, in the olden days, as you say, we have the technical knowledge, you have the economic resource. Let us put together and build this whole of Middle East. So from that point of view, I mean, uh, the adopted country has become the second home for most of the Indians. The shades and hues of the diaspora here are varied, but all of them have two things in common, their pride at being Indian and their burning desire to contribute their might to the prosperity and strength of their adopted country. Babu Kevalram is one of the veteran businessmen and a long-time resident of Bahrain. He has witnessed all ups and downs in the country's economy. His family has roots in the history of Bahrain since 1880, when his forefathers reached the shores of Bahrain for trading and financing of pearl exports for pearl divers. The business flourished and the Kevalrams expanded to showrooms specialized in textiles, garments, jewelry, and shoes. The Kevalram family has great influence in their adopted land. We are not, never considered as a foreigner. The rule had come in 1975. Any, any foreigner here expected, he has to take a 5149 local partner. We took a deputation through our embassy, Mr. Murlidhar Menon was the ambassador over here, he retired, now he's in Delhi. So he took our deputation to Amir and Amir said, no, this Banyan, I mean, they used to call us Banyan because we are Hindus, so they call us Banyan. Banyan community, they don't need any local partner. They are our nationals, you know, they have so much feeling for us. The Kaval Ram showrooms occupy the prime positions in Bahrain today. Having been around for so long, families like the Kaval Rams have become an inseparable part not just of the country's economy, but also of its culture. Their social life and affiliations illustrate a true exchange of cultures. Their loyalty to their country of adoption has never been questioned, and their attachment to their native land has never been viewed with suspicion. Our relations are very good. We are just like uh, brothers, and we have every time here Get, get together on Diwali. Yeah, from the beginning, it is not today, but from the beginning, when we have Diwali, you know, all the Arabs they come to wish, and this uh, here itself they come. Uh, about 80 to 100 people they come uh, on Diwali day to wish us. From the minister till the all locals, our friends, uh, business people, all they come and wish us. And on the Eid day, we go to their places and go and wish them for Eid. While most migrations to countries like the US and Britain benefit only those who are highly educated, migrations to countries in the Middle East benefit all classes, ranging from professionals to those providing personal services. These countries have ample employment opportunities in numerous industries, nursing, accountancy, managerial, as well as technical. Many of these migrants go with their families, but there are others who leave them back home. For this family staying in a suburb of Mumbai for more than 20 years now, it has become pretty much a part of their lives to stay alone. 
with their main bread earner earning in Saudi Arabia. Zamil Khan is a tailor by profession in the Al Hasa town of Saudi Arabia. His wife Nafisa knew even before her marriage that the man she is going to marry will be leaving his homeland for better prospects in the next year itself. But she was confident of his success. Today, she does not repent that decision. So, I have to do something for this money. Now, their responsibility was so much for five sisters to make a house, to make a house, to make a house, and to see the brothers. They were on the third number. But they were doing the work as the biggest thing. They were so much for this money. From the beginning, they were thinking that we had to do something. Family misses his presence and has only old photographs and letters to go through again and again. But their way generally does not extend for more than six months because Zamil works for only two seasons, spanning four to six months in total, and spends the remaining part of the year in India with his family. There are two seasons in there. They get 4-5 lakhs of rupees. So in those two seasons, the 4-5 lakhs of rupees are sold here. There are two houses here. There are two houses here. और हमारे ससुराल का 25 साल अगर वो वहाँ पर है रहकर कमा रहे तो आज हम मतलब बॉम्बे में हैं बॉम्बे में दिखाई दे रहे हैं अगर वो वहाँ जाते ही नहीं तो हम हो सकता है कि गांव में रहते गाजीपुर जैसे गांव जो कि अभी तक वहाँ पर बत्ती बराबर नहीं है जमील सन सरफराज टू इज रीपिंग द गेम्स ऑफ इज फादर सक्सेस in fact, the five cars owned and rented on business by him have also been bought from the money that his father sent. After that, I wanted to work on it, but when I was there, we could buy five cars from here. When there was a family function or anything, they would remember it. But I would like to feel very proud that my dad was there and they helped us for our home. The remittances that are received the remittances that are received from such countries become an important source of income for many families and also get reflected in the national income of India. In the year 2005-2006, NRI remittances touched the magic figure of 24.1 billion US dollars, making India the largest recipient of personal money transfers in the world. Currently, the Middle East contributes to 40% of total inward remittances followed by 30% from North America, 20% from Europe and 10% from other regions. But even as single expatriates like these as well as migrant families continue to make allegiances all across the Gulf, the nature of their migration is contractual and not permanent. They do not become non-resident Indians as these governments do not naturalize non-Arabs. But these expatriates don't seem to mind it due to tax-free salaries and the non-interfering business policies. I am most comfortable. Inner comfort is in Kuwait. So, uh, now I don't really also anticipate to make home somewhere else. So it's eventually not even, never for me, it's not a matter of nationality or something. I'm happy to be, I am respected as an Indian in Kuwait. There are many more passengers like these who have extended their journeys to unmapped milestones. These are people who dreamt of a better life and made it all come alive. People who have the capability to respond to new opportunities and challenges. Who, with their single-minded passion, have dared to go into terrains others find too risky. Many of them may not have hi-fi qualifications, but they all possess an overdose of guts and business acumen. Even in their temporary homes, they have managed to leave a permanent imprint. <laughs>